Greetings, everyone. My name is Russ McCree. Thanks for coming, sticking around. Mike Bailey on my right. Hey. We are, uh, unfortunately for some of you guys who are already here talking about CSERF very specifically and very targeted attacks against multiple platforms. Uh, there's certainly some crossover from the uh, fine performance you saw just prior to us, so we apologize for that, but our mission with this discussion is more to point out how very specifically this attack can be used across so many interfaces, so many platforms, so many places, and how incredibly inherent it is to most web apps. So um, there is some repeat. I apologize for that, but I think you'll find it. We'll try to skim over those parts. Yeah, exactly. We won't tell you how to fix it, we promise. Um, we won't tell you our employers, but in case you know, please don't attribute any of this to them. Carry on. All right. Basically, the gist of this talk is that CSRF is bad stuff. Um, it's, very, it's a very underappreciated vulnerability, and it's all over the place. Um, because it usually gets rated as a pretty minimal issue, it n almost never gets fixed. And that means that we have these kinds of holes all over. Space bar. Space bar. Bam. Okay. I'm not very good at this computer thing. That's all right. You're all right. Gonna... So in case you didn't know, in case you weren't at the last talk, basically a cross-site request forgery is um, making a user do something that he didn't intend to do, usually against another site. Okay, always against another site. Well, all right. Um, if, the, if that user is an authenticated user on, on that other website that you're attacking, um, you can use it to escalate privileges and perform actions that he didn't intend to do. Um, there, are, there are other attacks you can use that don't really have anything to do with the session or the authenticated user, but we'll get into that later. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the key concerns, again, is that, you know, okay, surprise, surprise, 90-plus percent of websites have vulnerabilities. Yes, we know. The reality is, though, certain things that can be fixed, certain things that can be done to prevent are so rarely done, and when the impact uh, in particular to CSERF attacks is so high, we believe that it really actually borders on negligence. And while that may be somewhat counterintuitive, we think that there's a responsibility here in uh, site coders and providers that really, uh, for, for reasons of millions and millions of people at risk, we think should be fixed. And Mike in particular has got some um, very, shall we say, some exemplars to prove that point. So we have... Uh, I would argue it's never ending. We're going to try to limit what we talk about here today. There are some things that we can't talk about that will be coming out, say, next four months probably is about accurate. Some, um, well, I won't even describe what they are, but suffice it to say the impacts are uh, larger than imagined with regard to anything we're going to show you today. But nonetheless, I think this stuff proves the point, particularly when it comes to wormable stuff and or um, just flat out in essence, compromise of a system right up to admin, so. All right, let's roll, let's move along. Okay, cross-site request forging. It still works. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! All right, we're going to show you how to prevent it. We, we'll breeze through that, because that's not interesting here. But um, first of all, we're going to show you what you can break with it. All right. Um, <laughs> We get this oh, one all the time when we this. try to report stuff, and it's like, well, look, it doesn't matter because somebody has to do something stupid. Well, yes, but if somebody does something stupid in the context of your application, it's still your problem, and they obviously don't care. So everyone clicks links. Yes, we know. Mike can tell you in particular to the extent that somebody obviously clicked a link, i.e., the CEO of Strong Webmail, and it cost him $10,000, which Mike paid for this trip with. So... <laughs> <laughs> Explain. That's probably worthwhile. It's worth a beer, too. I have beer. Check Thank you, out. Trey Ford. So my mom's going to watch this video later, and she's going to be pissed. <laughs> Mike's additional skill is that he actually brewed this beer. <laughs> All right. So strong webmail. This is a fun story. I was just sitting on my computer one day and up on Twitter pops uh, some people were passing this link around to strongwebmail.com um, they were having this contest that if you can hack into our webmail you get 10 grand and a couple of us were, you know, we're just passing the link around joking about it like yeah that's not, that's not going to go well and then um, Lance James uh, if, you, if you're on Twitter he's XSS exploits he says you know 
let's go ahead and do this. Let's go sign up for an account and get it and win this money. And we're like, and I'm like, okay. So it, Lance bankrolls it. He pays the five dollars to set up an account. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lance. Yeah, and it, once we got once we set up an account and logged in, within the first minute we found cross site scripting holes. Um, <laughs> we we uh, where were they going? All right. <laughs> Once we had the cross-site scripting holes, it was just a matter of coding a payload and figuring out how to get it to execute. We weren't sure if the CEO of, that, of the company actually checked this email account. We figured it was probably just a dummy account set up because we didn't really think they were planning on paying. And so we sent in, the cross-site scripting hole we found, the, um, it involved injecting HTML into the subject um, line of an email. And when he'd view it in the email webmail client, it would execute and own his account. We had to figure out how to get him to look at this email because we didn't think he actually logged in. So what we did, is we, put, we set the subject of that email to, hey, we think we've won. <laughs> <laughs> and, and who could resist clicking on that? <laughs> so he... You know, we're watching the logs. As soon as he hits that, it, um, the payload executes, and we got all the information we needed to win our ten grand. <laughs> <laughs> and so, while that's not really a cross-site request forgery story, it's a fun story, and it demonstrates our next point here. Quick tools. I mean, the the thing about tools is, yeah, you can do this either manually, whatever you want, any kind of proxying. Mechanism. I prefer Tamper Data. He likes Hackbar. You know, for IE heads, there's Fiddler. All the same thing. See the parameter, break the app. Like the McAfee Secure app. Okay. Sorry, James. <laughs> McAfee Secure. This is one that hit. This was. In the, it was in the news. I think in May. Um, I published some cross-site request forgery holes in the McAfee. Actually, it's McAfee. I found out last night. It's you pronounce it McAfee. Um, but I found some cross-site request forgery holes in their McAfee Secure application, which you use to scan websites and find vulnerabilities in websites. <laughs> so, so I was using this application, actually, and I noticed that it wasn't... Um, we'll get into the protections a little bit later. We'll, brush, we'll go through that quickly. But I noticed it wasn't protecting against this stuff. So I coded in a payload... And I set up an a, a exploit so that if you hit my evil website and you're logged into their account, I add myself as an administrative user to your account, and then I can scan your website for vulnerabilities. And so it's just kind of ironic having that in the McAfee Secure Portal. Uh, I actually have uh, screenshots from it. Basically, I just described what happens, though. You've got three users set up on this account. You hit my website. It has an iframe. I mean, I've got the URL there. The basic idea is add user dot whatever. Um, it loads that up in an iframe, adds my user, and shoots me an email with my temporary password. So this, this is completely blind and uh, zero knowledge attack. If you're logged in, I, I get an email with, my, with an account password. All right. And obviously, the McAfee implications are many because the ability to then scan whomever, whenever, however, gives you a whole another subset of vulnerabilities to play with. So, uh, Linksys, this one was something that I stumbled on because I actually have this device at the house. No, it's not available to the internet. Uh, and ultimately, when reporting it uh, in a brand new WRT160N uh, internal device, Linksys said, and I quote, I apologize if you guys are here anywhere. We can't reasonably present, prevent CSERFs without bogging down our code. The compromise we made here is to have a timeout on the web interface so users are logged out after 10 minutes of inactivity. We also advise users not to click on suspicious links while logged into the web interface or close the web interface as soon as they're finished configuring the router. They claim this language is on the site. I've not seen it. I did go looking for it. And obviously, none of these mitigations are particularly useful when it comes to breaking things which I will show you. So here's logging in with my known good account. Hope you guys can see this within reason. You can see that my current password is I'm a doofus. And it, of course, will let me in. And there we are. 
So in classic attack form, well, first the form itself, it will ultimately force the account to change its passwords to really doofus. And we'll do that through the classic social engineering attempt. From your friends at Linksys, please log into your router and upgrade now, which inevitably somebody will always click. <laughs> and you'll find that, in fact, now if I log back in as if I were the attacker, I'll be doing so with the account that the CSERF script forced, which isn't, again, really doofus. Now, this is an attack on one network device, one router. When we started looking at this kind of thing, we found out that almost every web application we look at has these kinds of holes, especially the ones that are sitting on your internal network. Yep. And everybody thinks, you know, my internal network's safe. Nobody else can get to that, except for your browser can get to it. So we're, um, I think we have a few more examples of other, other devices that sit on your internal network that are vulnerable to this kind of attack. Netgear, on my, uh, I know Sean hates blogs, I understand. On my blog just prior to DEF CON, I did a Netgear attack. I don't bother you with it here, but it's very much the same thing where uh, we were able to force the remote management interface on, where typically it's off by default, and immediately change the access port as well uh, in a fashion that it made it somewhat visible, not only to me, but to any bots going by. So um, somewhat interesting. Other infrastructure devices, though, I mean, think about it off the grid. It's not just stuff that's available to the Internet, right? Think about it from an intranet perspective and the, shall we say, you know, evil attacker on the inside. Who, who uses Ubuntu? <laughs> How many of you use uh, transmission for your BitTorrent client? How many of you would tell me if you did? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, this has actually been fixed in the current version. I don't know if it's been fixed in the current version in the Ubuntu archives or in, it, but, or in their... Um, yeah, but I was talking about this a little while back on my blog. Uh, it, for some reason, Transmission has a web interface built into it. The latest version of it does. That just came out recently. And this web interface is enabled by default, but only accessible to the local user. So I honestly don't know why this is even needed, um, because the local user obviously has access to the regular application. Um, but at any rate. Um, the local user can access this web interface. This interface is vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. So if you hit my website, I can force you to create, uh, to create rest requests to your own application on 127.0.0.1, and it will change the, I can change the directory you're downloading all your files to, and then I can force you to download a file of my choice. So I actually, was, while I was testing this, I accidentally changed that, the directory to my main root directory, and I downloaded a file that overwrote the whole thing. <laughs> so it works. It works really well. And I'm glad I have backups. Self-surf. All right. This is a fun one. ESPN.com. I think that it's, it, it's a very highly ranked tra uh, traffic site. I think it's like number 14. I don't know if that's in the U.S. or overall, but is that overall? Okay. Um, up until recently, they were vulnerable to both HTML injection and cross-site request forgery. This makes this little perfect storm for a bug, you know, for an exploit, that you can have a site performing cross-site request forgeries against itself. So it's not really cross-site, but same principle. And what you can do here is you can actually worm this thing without any client-side scripting at all. So if you think no script's going to save you from this kind of attack, you're dead wrong. Um, it basically, by creating these requests back to this site itself, we can um, add this HTML code to any profile that view, of any user who views my profile, and we can uh, propagate this payload across the entire site. So this one's uh, somewhat interesting. It's not that broadly used in application, but where it's used is kind of what's fascinating because it includes things like uh, MCI. It's very European in nature. Uh, Securitas, Red Cross France, and in case you wanted to know anything about the missile defenses of the Belgian Defense Agency, this is one way you could actually lift the data. They have missiles, apparently. They do have two missiles in Belgium. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> case one broke. So... <laughs> Do 
do, do. So just a calendar. This is uh, they use it as a learning portal for folks to go get training inherent to the organization. But what's rather uh, amazing is that not only is it vulnerable to CSERP, but it's also vulnerable to script injection as well. So you can then drop uh, all kinds of evil wear in there if you wish. Kudos to our friends at XSS.org. I promised them I'd say hi. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's very simple. There's nothing to it other than pushing a frame, pushing whatever content you want into the calendar, and then anybody coming along in the general context of a session, they do not need to be authenticated, can be uh, instantly owned as needed. So obviously, not much good. And then OS Commerce, this one, you know, okay, so surprise, surprise, web apps that are feeding customers and websites, uh, particularly for shopping carts, et cetera, are broken. This is uh, obviously a well-known, perhaps quite obvious statement. The issue we took with it is the fact that um, OS Commerce alone, and this is not an exaggeration, we figured current installs is about 9 million and change. Um, unfortunately, again, discovered while picking on McAfee Secure because uh, literally two-thirds of these sites are branded McAfee Secure, indicating, in fact, that they might not be. <laughs> I'm checking Twitter right now. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Hmm. So this one's interesting, and particularly because of credit card. We're going to work on the admin account. I'm logged in as admin currently, and I will uh, fall victim to an attack. One of the things I want you to see, first and foremost, is the fact that Fred Flintstone's account does, in fact, include his credit card. Nice. In case you're having a difficult time funding this little adventure, that's a real number. Kidding. So we, trick, we uh, tricked Fred into stepping on board and adding an admin user. Frank is now an admin user thanks to the script we've thrown at him. I log in as Frank with my handy dandy account. I go back to Fred Flintstone's account which is now visible to me and I as the attacker now own his credit card. So. Again, all through very fundamentally simple c serve attacks. The thing that's frustrating here is, and I believe Sean in the last talk is that we walked in with saying this, is that everyone assumes c serves about get, right? These are all post attacks. I haven't used a single get attack in these circumstances. So when we talked about that, and Mike and I were chatting, we discovered that, oh no, that means there's another problem. Zencart was forked off of OS Commerce a while back. It's basically the same code. Well, it's been changed a lot since then, but it's built off the same code base. So we found out that it's vulnerable to the same thing. And that gives us another 7,330,000 sites that are vulnerable, which gives us a grand total of 16 million some odd uh, websites that are taking credit cards and storing data and vulnerable to cross site request forgery. And this isn't a minor vulnerability. I mean, you can add admin users to any of these sites. That's a big deal. An even bigger deal, in my opinion, is cPanel. cPanel, if you don't know it, it's a mass host. It's a admin administrative web interface for mass hosted servers. Let's ask the question: How many people here have a website? Come on! Come on! <laughs> How many people here probably use a website with cPanel on a hosted provider? You're all lying. Look at you. There's so many more of you out here. What's the problem? All right. The WHM interface, the web hosting manager, it's vulnerable to cross-site request forgeries. If you're logged in as an administrator or as root on this server, which people do because apparently you need to manage your web server through a web interface, if you're logged in as root and you hit my website or you hit any website I control, I can do anything I want. I can reset your root password. I can upgrade software. I can, I can modify any setting I want. I can suspend, unsuspend accounts, change FTP settings, anything I want through this, the WHM interface. That's scary and that's bad. What's even more scary was the response that I got from uh, cPanel. Do we have that here? I don't know about the response, but we certainly have the video. Uh, we have a video. <laughs> we like video. 
right. The response that I got from cPanel was, we can't fix this because it's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they're worried it's going to break third party or integration with third party billing software, so they can't remove, they can't fix this vulnerability. And so we have literally millions and millions of uh, web servers that are they're sitting there ready to be rooted, and cPanel won't fix it. They do have a cross-site request forger protection feature. Off by it default. doesn't do much. Yeah. It checks the refers. Uh, this is actually, can I pause it? With sure. Space. Yeah. What it does is it checks the refers of the request that's made to the server, and it makes sure that it either comes from its own server, so you can't do it across sites, or uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't send refers. In fact, there's an RFC that states that if you're on an SSL server, you don't send refers. So they have to obviously accept requests that don't have any refer at all in the browser in the request header. If you're using cPanel without SSL, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> True. You want your video? Yes. <laughs> now, there's plenty of other ways to strip ref refers if you are worried about this, but the easiest way is just to bounce somebody through an SSL encrypted site. And that's easy enough because there's plenty of SSL encrypted sites that have open redirects on them. There's plenty of them that have other issues. So cross-site scripting, anything I want, I can make this request to your web server and root your cPanel server. And in this case, I'm actually um, throwing in a cross-site scripting thing, but that's, another, that's actually a different demo. <laughs> that's a different talk. But that was just me getting root access on that server. Before we get into the misconceptions, why don't you cover some of the, the smaller, more annoying things that were on your mind earlier? Which ones? The, uh, There's a lot of annoying things I know, on my mind. Amazon, eBay. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, so there's some other uses for cross-site request forgery that a lot of people aren't thinking about. The, and the, one, the classic example of the cross-site request forgery is either you know, owning somebody's bank account, transferring money to your account, or doing the privilege escalation through an administrator who's got access to something. But there's a lot of sites that just, they just take any request you send them, and they do things with it. Um, and it turns out you can actually do a lot of things that they don't, want you to do. Um, an example of this, Amazon.com. When you, whenever you're browsing th through products on Amazon, and you come back to the site later, you'll see all the products you've recently viewed, or a few of them, and they're there to try and sell you more products or try and sell you something you already bought. But if I can make you view that site, with using a, or not view it, but request the site with a cross-site request forgery. Next time you come back to your to Amazon.com, you're going to see any product that I want sitting in that recently viewed items box, and that may not make a whole lot of sense, but with the money that people spend to for advertising, put it, putting something on the front page of Amazon, that seems like that would be a big deal. Uh, it also works with eBay. There's a recently viewed items box there. Um, if you're using, I'm trying to remember what it was. I, yeah, yeah, um, huh? No, uh, okay. I try, I'm trying to remember which site it was. There's actually a handful of them, but there's a handful of web, of major e-commerce portals where I can actually stuff items into your your um, shopping cart using cross-site request forgery. So, I mean, if you're looking through your shopping cart and you wonder why you've got um, why you've got these products sitting in there. I mean, you may click on them, you may look at them, and you may buy them later. I mean, e either way, it's good advertising. It's getting the product right in front of your eyes. But there's also the issue then of forcing somebody's history to change. So if you think yes. about that history. From, yes. If I can manipulate your, your search history, think of all the fun things I can do with that. Um, again, I can use it for spamming, um, or I can, I can stuff your search history full of, um, full of links to whatever product it is I'm trying to sell. Um, <laughs> What if it's worse than product? I mean, there's, there's, there's legal implications here, too. That's kind of what we're there trying are. to drive at. So if you think about the ability to force somebody's history to basically contain People that have been prosecuted on the, yes. on, based on their search history before. That's exactly right. So if you want to really hose somebody and something is, uh, in particular, certain search engines are vulnerable to the ability to force Just that Just as a history. side note, and this is actually, Russ doesn't know I'm going to talk about this, but 
he works for an evil corporation. And that corporation happens to have your search history displayed on uh, yeah. whenever you go to their, their major search portal that just barely came out a little while ago. <laughs> it has a search history, and I can stuff it full of links to whatever product I want to sell or whatever malware I want to sell. I mean, if you want to buy malware I or just download don't it. know what you're talking about. Ah, well. Misconceptions. So uh, <laughs> Mr. Sullivan over at Black Hat, I think, talked about um, URL rewriting as, a, as an option to fix this. I would by no means disrespectfully disagree, but uh, to some extent we take issue with that. Obviously, the, the majority of the things that people think should fix this issue don't. Um, thoughts there real fast? We're, we've gone amazingly fast, which Have is we? unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can just talk later. <laughs> Where are we going with this? Just basically. All right. Um, some, some things that actually do work to protect against cross-site request forgery, and um, I said I'd get into this later, but um, a CAPTCHA is basically it's forcing the user to manually do something and um, do it on purpose in order to make a request. Um, another, uh, you know what, you go ahead and take this one. I'm not thinking straight. <laughs> you okay? Long yeah, night. I'm all right. I'm a little bit wired. I've had a lot of coffee this morning. <laughs> the, the issues around captures, of course, is that they're most often broken, number one, and often they're two. A capture itself might be based on a token, and if that token's repeatable, obviously you pass it once, you pass it again, and you're through. It's a very simple, uh, shall we say, bypass and doesn't really work. The, arguably, the most important fix of all is a unique token. But again, how strong a unique token are you using, number one? And are there now all of a sudden magically in the last four weeks attacks that will even compromise you there through CSS history? Do you want to clarify that one? I are you clear-headed enough for that? Uh, <laughs> okay, so this, this is an attack that came out um, just, the last, I think, about two weeks ago. Yep. Um, well, the, the CSS history hack is a well-known hack in the web apps um, security industry. In that, basically what it does is it uses CSS to find out what links you've visited before. So it colors a link blue, and then it um, checks the link to see what color it is. And if you visit it, if you visit it it'll be a different color than if you haven't visited it before. Um, and theoretically, well, it's not actually, it's not all theory. I mean, you can use this to compromise a cross-site request forgery a protection token um, by just brute forcing that token and see, find, you just generate a whole bunch of different options and you see which one works. Um, it doesn't work so well if the token is not hard to predict, if it's long and if it's, um, if it's randomly generated, it doesn't work very well. So. The point I'm trying to make is to make sure that your, cross your CSRF validation tokens are cryptographically secure. The, the final thought on it, too, is that even there, particularly, what was it, DDWRT, that router, no protection in the world was even impl implemented on it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you didn't even have to be logged into the device because the checks were so insecure. So ultimately, you could via a CSERF attack own the device without any mitigation in place at all. So a lot of it comes back to secure development practices, which we're not going to get into here. Uh, and unfortunately, we flew through this thing. So that's kind of it. We can open up to Q&A if you want here. Uh, I can have Mike go on forever. But really, it's up to you guys, sir. The reality is, unless better development practices are put in place. Say again? I'm sorry, you're right. Absolutely. So the gentleman said that, uh, in particular with regard to things like do not call lists uh, for marketing, that you know the more prevalent web applications become as services for marketing, services for tracking, services for analytics, et cetera, if they're, in fact, not 
coded properly, mitigated properly, that then attacks against privacy, you're going to be even more and more stringent. I think really the thing to look at for us is, too, what does it mean uh, in the now cloud or SaaS? I mean, there's so many buzzwords now where they're putting everything out in the out in the internet or in the world. And, uh, and again, I find so often that they're not protected, so it really is an issue. There's a mic over here, so... Can you pop that mic on, boss? Hello. There you go. Good. All right. Uh, about in inserting browser uh, histories, forcing browser histories into unsuspecting users. We have people in this country being prosecuted criminally for the contents of their browser history in part. Uh, Mike, would you care to comment about what type of forensic trails you're leaving when uh, you're injecting uh, someone else's browser, well, false browser history into an unsuspecting uh, end user. The really tricky thing about this attack is that it really can be completely anonymized. Um, if I can, I can inject these cross-site request forgeries, uh, any website that I can put, uh, put any HTML or a deep linked image in, MySpace, I mean, I can put a link in MySpace to an image on, that's on another domain. I, there's no way you're going to track that back to my per, to me personally. You may possibly be able to um, track it back to MySpace, but uh, that's not. I mean, who doesn't browse MySpace? Okay, well, nobody does anymore. But it, from a forensic perspective, it's very difficult. So in the context he's talking about, it's one of those things where okay, you know a user executed something, and it's attributable then to that user which is fine, but if that's not the actual user who did it because he was forced, the only forensic trail you might have is if the back end of the, shall we say, the system he's using, the social engineering site, pick it, if they're tracking IP access, but even that's not going to get him anything because it's coming through. So you really have you know, almost no mitigation whatsoever. It's Another really interesting attack that we have that I actually was going to talk about, but I didn't, is using cross-site request forgeries to make other people perform attacks for you. If you want to DDoS a site, you just put a whole bunch of cross-site request forgery tokens into a high, or not tokens, put a whole bunch of deep linked images to, that re point to a really high, um, a high resource, uh, I, whatever I'm saying. Multiple requests. Yeah. And you make it so that it, you know, lock up the server by just pulling a, pulling a huge da database query or something like that. Um, another attack, if you have, or they going? Oh, if you have file injection holes, which are really still pretty common in web applications, but you don't want them to see that, you know, I, I don't want somebody to see that it's me making these requests. That's fine. I can just put links to it in MySpace. Somebody else will uh, own the site for me. You know, I can inject scripts. I can uh, perform all these attacks. I can do SQL injection. Uh, I can do it all through cross-site request forgery. Have somebody else do, take care of the dirty work for me. Again, none of which attributable to anybody but the poor victim. So, well, from, sir. from the standpoint of forensics, you modify the search history. You're not placing the data from those locations. Sure. So I would have a hole from something that I actually went to, search history, to data that's not on the drive. So it might be the, the essence of data being missing, uh, cache data being missing that I might look at. Is that true? Or, or is modifying the search history placing those, the actual uh, access of those you uh, are websites. making the request with cross-site request version. Your browser, I mean... It actually visits the site? It visits the site. If I load this page up in an iframe, you make the request, and you'll, you'll load any images inside the site. So it looks like completely legitimate browsing as far as the user side goes. Okay. Although in the case of the browser history attack, if you force something into somebody's browser history, that they may not have visited. Is that a fair analogy? And in that case, if they haven't that's, visited... That's it, what I was talking it, about. Right. I'm getting the, the, the forensics nuance there is that the trail may stop at the history file that says it, but if you truly are a good forensic investigator right. and you haven't my, dug in... My index.dat would tell me not I went there, it. my cache would tell me there's this hole. That's right. And okay. so there are theoretically some gaps, but again, it's the quality of the investigator doing it, and certainly yeah, would be uh, enough to cause you significant problems. But yes, a good guess. Russ is the one with the forensic background, so... <laughs> Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you do it through, you know, any of the known anonymizers, then it's all that much worse. I mean, you know, theoretically, you've compromised somebody's box and you make requests through their box via C-Surf. I mean, they're, you know, it's, it's on and on, so. Sir. 
Hi, uh, I was a little bit late. I don't know if I missed this, but uh, did you mention uh, any uh, client-side protections that people in this audience might use uh, to generally protect themselves? That's a good question, actually. Um, the, as far as client-side protection goes, there's not a whole lot right now. There's some really cool stuff coming, though. Um, NoScript just added some... It, everybody here uses NoScript, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, NoScript just added what I believe it's called the ABE, the Application Boundary Enforcer. Um, it's a feature that um, forces, it basically protects different zones on your web, on your web, on your web browser. So it, I can't, my application can't make requests to your local internet zone or to your local machine. It's very good. It's not quite 100% yet, but it's coming, and I really like it. Another thing that's coming up, um, Mozilla just announced that they're putting together. It's I've seen I I'm forgetting all the abbreviations for things, but I think right. content just tell them what it does framework policy something <laughs> or other. Um, it basically, it's a feature that um, it does the same thing only way better. It makes it so that any uh, your if and <laughs> this is all opt in. So if my website, if I send a header back saying protect my website, don't let any, any cross site request forgeries happen, um, your browser won't make any requests to any outside domains at all. And that is what is it, it's exactly what we need. The problem is that it's opt in, and if it wasn't opt in, it would break the entire internet. But it's the single protection. I mean, that's really it from a perspective of how comprehensive can you get. But again, if you leave it such that it's opt in, it's something you don't have to use and thus fall victim. Right, thanks. I appreciate the uh, uh, mention of NoScript's ABE, but uh, I have to, because you didn't plug this for me, I figured I should mention, um, I'm actually the author of a Firefox extension called Request Policy. Cool. I don't uh, know if you've heard of that one, but that I owe one, you a beer. That, <laughs> that one would actually protect against just about everything you mentioned except the attack that involved a request to the same site. Since that's not right. cross-site, uh, you know, that's a different issue in that sense. So, but uh, other than that, of course, this, uh, this means someone has to install the extension, be running Firefox. This is not something that you can you know, propagate and have developers use on their website to protect uh, users everywhere. But for those in the audience, that's something. Yeah, definitely so, look thanks. it up because it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> uh, that's request policy. Uh, <laughs> I was asked to repeat it, yes. <laughs> well, so, dudes, come see us. So, cause, you know, I apologize for not knowing of it, but I'd love to No, no, it's it. pretty new, actually. Cool. I just wanted to see if you no, knew that. No, good. That's come cool. up later. So. Another question? Uh, have you done any cross-site request forgery jumping out of a sandbox, like using multiple browsers, or if I have IE and Mozilla open and I'm doing my open uh, uh, surfing on IE, but I'm doing my quote-unquote secure surfing in Mozilla? Cross-site request forgery, I mean, by nature, the attack focuses on the browser and, uh, and exploring the browser. I have some ideas. There may be stuff coming. We'll see what works. So All right. I, I do have some stuff I've been meaning to work on there. Oh, he's walking by. Yep. Anyone else? All right. We'll give you some time back. We appreciate you guys coming out, everybody. Thanks. Thank